We're going to get started with the revised upper limb module. So my name is Matt Civitello and I work at Orlando um, at Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando and I'm working with Amy Pasternak who works at Boston Children's Hospital. So if anyone was paying attention this morning, you got round one of Boston Orlando with Dr. Darris and Dr. Finkel. We are round two of Orlando and Boston. I don't know if that was done on purpose or not, but um, and we're going to go over the revised upper limb module. Um, and the reason we have Elena Mazzoni's name up there is she kind of is the person who put this test together. It was kind of the leader of the group who put this test together. And we got most of this presentation uh, from her. She allowed us to use it. So that's why her name is, is up there. So we're going to go over um, general testing. We're going to go over instructions, equipment, starting position, and scoring. And I will do the beginning part, and then Amy's going to go over item by item, and then I get to play the role of patient up there on, so you guys can get to see an idea of what we're doing. Before I go further, we did this in the other room. How many of you have done this test before? Oh, some more on this. And how? And do, the ones who have done it, do you do it often or just a couple times? Just a, okay. So that just gives us an idea of okay. So we're going to go through the general testing instructions first. Um, so the same evaluator should perform the evaluations at subsequent assessments. So it should, you know, the person doing the test from the beginning or time to time, and you know, when they come through the clinic, should be the same throughout each assessment. Items should be formed in order provided in the manual. And each item can be scored unilaterally or on both sides. So first right, then left side unless it's a bilateral task or the scoring options include a bimanual option. So you're going to do up to three good attempts are allowed per task. Um, as you've heard over the last day and a half, you know, there is a fatigue factor here, so we don't want each item doing, there's 19 items in the test, we don't want you to spend 10 or 15 minutes on one item because they will get tired as you go through. So make sure they understand. Uh, the instructions, make sure it's their best attempt and for collaboration purposes, rests are allowed so they can't take a breast like you heard um, in the Chop and Tend and I'm sure with Terry and Sally about the Hammersmith. It's up to, it's acceptable for the evaluator to demonstrate the task and suggest alternative strategies within scoring options and we'll go over a little bit of that later. So make sure you show them the item and how to do it. Is you're allowed to do a hands-on demonstration and if they don't understand the task, um, you can mark there is a cannot test option. So this is the equipment um, that you can see. So you get an adjustable tabletop surface, um, the tablecloth, the pencils, the coins, the plastic cup, the three metric weights, the cuff weight, a Ziploc container, and a push light button. Um, there are links on the little disc you got to show where you can get the test. It's not like a standard kit. You can't call someone and say, hey, can we have a kit? So we have links for like Amazon where you can buy this stuff and make your own kit. Make your own kit. And Alan pointed out in our last talk over there that the mat you see, what he did on a PowerPoint program and printed it at Kinko's. So it can be done. So patient positioning, which is very important, there's two options. You can be in your wheelchair or in an appropriate size chair for the patient. You want the seat parallel as possible to the ground, the backrest in an upright position, and their feet supported. So that's important. We don't want, you know, you don't want a small child in a big chair where they're not supported or the other way around where their feet are too high. So you want that good 90-90 position. An adjustable height table is probably the most important um, item because you'll see as we go along on a, a height surface. Um, so if they're in their wheelchair, you want the table height at the armrest level of the wheelchair. If they're sitting in a chair, like you'll see me sitting in a chair without armrest, then you want it the, the height at the umbilicus level. Okay, for the reaching items, the start positions are elbows and forearms are supported on the armrest or flexed at 90 degrees. And all items that include elbow and or shoulder flexion, the arm can slide on an armrest onto the exam surface. So you get a little picture of that little boy there. 
And then the moving and manipulation items, armrest resting on the exam surface. As you can see, is the arms are already on the surface. So patient positioning. Preferably, TLSO should not be worn during the test. But if you have to use the TLSO, then make sure there's a spot on the score sheet on the front page where you can write down the TLSO and the type because we want to make sure then you're carrying that forward each time because that can change their, their ability to perform some of the items if they're getting that support at their trunk. So no extremity splints or assistive devices are allowed. So again, on the patient positioning, you can see we highlighted the comment section. So you can describe the testing environment. So when you look back, when the patient comes back in four months later or six months later, you don't have to remember what you did. You can have it written down. So you can use the comment section to really describe how you did each patient. There is a manual. Um, so then you can see a little bit up there on the Top right, there's some, there's some pictures, and then the scoring 0, 1, and 2, and there's scoring instructions and everything inside the manual, which I believe is also on your, your drive. Um, again, on the performer, you can make note of elbow contractures. So the test was designed with elbow contractures in mind, so because you're doing it through their full available range. So if you test a patient and they have a 30 degree elbow flexion contracture, you just write that down and then that's their available range. That's what you're testing. It doesn't impact the score. So there's the entry item, um, which will establish the maximum functional level before you start the assessment. And then there's 19 items to go through. And it's from proximal to distal. And then the scoring, as we said, is zero. You're unable to perform the task and, or don't initiate the movement. Score of one is you're able to partially perform the task or incompletely. And then the score of two is able to perform the entire task and perform it completely. And then you get a total score, which is 37 on the test. And you sum up the scores on the right and left side for all items. Scoring considerations, as I mentioned a minute ago, that does take into account, the, you know, there's elbow contractures or pro, pronation supination contractures or wrist deviation in contractures. But if you feel like they're really limited and it affects their score, there is an LBC, so a limited by contracture on the scoring assessment, as you can see there, circled. Preparing for the test, do not examine the previous results. You don't want to bias yourself to know what they're doing beforehand. Keep the environment free of distraction so the parents are encouraged to leave the room so that they're not distracted. If, if you can get a good exam that way, sometimes I keep my parents in the corner if the kid needs them in the room but not a part of the test. And rest breaks are allowed. So now we're going to go into the item review and go over some testing positions, the instructions, and common compensations. And at the end, we're going to watch a video. I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Okay, so there's a, it looks like there's a handful of people that administer this somewhat consistently, and a lot of people that this test is new to. For the sake of time today and for the sake of the fact that it is getting towards the end of the day so that I'm sensing people are getting a little fatigued in the audience, which is understandable, we're not going to go through the nitty gritty details of scoring of every single item, but we're going to do an overview of each item because there are 19 items and then end with a couple of videos of the test from start to finish. A little bit more background on this assessment. Elena Mazzoni in Rome is the, uh, is the brains behind this, this work. And her original work was called the upper limb module. So for those of you who have been in the field of SMA for a long time, you may have originally administered the OM or the upper limb module. That was designed primarily for non-ambulant individuals living with SMA. It was designed to complement gross motor function that we capture on assessments like the Hammersmith. As we collected data and learned more about SMA, we realized, in fact, for sure, individuals with type 3 SMA also experience upper extremity weakness that impacts their daily function. Some of the things that patients that I work with report are not only overhead tasks, like difficulties or fatigue with washing their hair or um, blow drying their hair, 
reaching f to lift heavy containers into a cabinet, but also intrinsic hand weakness. So um, resting tremors in these individuals along with muscle weakness can limit their independence with taking the cap off of a water bottle or pulling up a tab on a can of soda. And so looking at distal and proximal strength for even ambulant individuals is clinically important. Okay, We're going to go through each item and Matt is going to be our awesome um, demonstrator or model but then we also have some videos with individuals who actually have SMA. So the entry item is not is the only item that isn't scored, and this item is just to give you an idea of that person's function. Do they have strength that allows them to function overhead? Do they have strength that allows them to function just at shoulder level? Or do they have strength that only allows them to function at the level, uh, level of a surface, table surface, okay? So for this item, you're going to pull the individual away from the table so that you have room to see them, especially if they're stronger. And you're going to ask them to fully abduct their arms up overhead with their elbows extended. So we're looking for full abduction, elbows extended, with uh, ability to bring their hands overhead. OK, so Matt, can you bring your arms overhead? Perfect. So Matt gets a full score on the entry level item. OK? The next item, the next score down would be that Matt can bring his arms up over his head, but with some compensation. So he has some degree of shoulder weakness. So he's flexing his arms and reducing the lever arm. He is maybe leaning at his trunk, but he is getting his shoulder, his elbows at least above 90 degrees of shoulder abduction. Next score down is that Matt can bring his elbows to his shoulder level, but not above. Next score down is that Matt is, we're going to put a 200 gram weight in the cup, and I'm going to say, Matt, can you bring the cup to your mouth with one or two hands? Okay. If that's hard for Matt, I'm going to say, okay, that's too hard, but can you just bring, the, bring your hands to your mouth? Okay, so all of these items were designed to be functionally relevant. So we're looking at arm function, I'm sorry, arm strength as it relates to functional activities of daily living. And finally, if that's too hard, Matt, are you able to at least control your joystick or pick up a pen or a pencil or utensil from the table? So maybe he doesn't have anti-gravity strength of his elbow, but he can use his hands purposefully. And if he can do none of those things, then his entry level score will be the lowest score. Okay? So we'll go to some of our slides here. <clears throat> get over here. So this young, young girl in this video has type 3 SMA and she gets a full score for the entry level item. Okay, So she does a nice job of abducting her arms all the way overhead with her elbows fully extended with a great smile on her face. One thing that I forgot to mention is that um, this is a nice assessment to do towards the end of your evaluation if you can. So we usually try to do the gross motor assessment first and end with this. And one of the reasons is because many individuals we work with do tend to look forward to this assessment, you, especially kids. Like You have this fun bag of tricks that you're bringing out with you, and even if they've seen that bag of tricks many times in their life at this point, they still seem to kind of look forward to, to this test. So it's a nice one to kind of end on a bang with. Um, other tips for positioning that I found. So, you know, we work with kids and we also work with young adults. And so kids tend to be a little bit easier to position. So a uh, written activity chair or a Theradapt activity chair, if their wheelchair um, isn't great for allowing you to get to a nice table surface. Um, or for a young adults that use power wheelchairs, it does get more tricky, especially if they're weaker and they have more limited arm function. So usually I find the plinth in our clinic that goes to its high, the highest high-low plinth that I can find. I raise the plinth all the way up and I have the person drive their power wheelchair in as far as they can get. And then I swing away the armrests and the joysticks and finish driving the wheelchair in myself for them and then lower the high-low plinth back down. And this is important because we want um, weaker individuals to have their arms rested at the correct start position at 90 degrees. And in order to do that, you need to bring their power wheelchair way up close. 
Um, otherwise, they'll be even able they'll be able to only do very few items. Okay, it's a little bit tricky for setup. All right, so let's go into the actual items now. So the first item, item B, is can you bring your hands from your lap to the table? So I'm going to have Matt sit with his hands resting on his thighs, and I'm going to say, can you bring your hands from the lap onto the table at the same time? So a full score of two is that Matt can bring his hands onto the table at the same time simultaneously. Full score of two. Okay, for the sake of time, Matt, can you demonstrate a score of one? Okay. So a score of one is that the person can bring one hand to the table, but not two. Okay? Some common compensations that we see for this item. Matt? <laughs> they might climb their fingers up onto the table, or they'll bring their hands together and have to clasp their hands and then put them on the table. So we're looking for a true um, forearm flexion, okay? And clearing the surface to get the hands onto the table. And please ask questions as you go if you desire because I know it is getting towards the end of the day. So. Okay, so moving on to item C, completes a path. This is an item that involves tracing a path with a pencil. So you're gonna have a standard pencil, not a pen, because pens are, you are, you are, obviously we all know, you need to produce more force to produce a mark with a pen. And so kids with SMA are weaker and may, a pen may limit their ability to complete this task. So you're gonna use a pencil. You're gonna position the paper in front of them in the way that they desire. So it could be angled, but once you find that position, that position has to remain the same throughout the duration of their attempt for the task. If they need to rotate the paper in order to complete the task, that's a compensation and you would score down. Okay? So you're going to say, can you complete the path bringing the car to the finish line without stopping or taking the pencil off the paper? So Matt's going to create a smooth motion with his hand. For this item, we are not looking, this is not a dexterity item, this is not looking at handwriting, this is looking at hand and wrist and forearm strength, okay? So we're, there's no requirement that the line needs to stay within the path, it can go out of the, pa out of the path a little bit. We're just looking for a smooth, continuous motion. All of these items we're administering bilaterally, okay? So in the dominant and the non-dominant hand. Okay. For a score of two, this young lady is able to complete the path with her right hand fully and continuously without resting or repositioning her hand. Okay. Matt, can you demonstrate a score of one? Okay, so Matt stopped, he paused. Um, other things that kids do is they rest their hand, they reposition it, and then they continue. Okay, great. Item D, picking up coins. These are coins that are between the size of a quarter and a nickel. <laughs> the coins that we have in our clinic are arcade coins, so anywhere you can find coins, I know that the links have specific um, parameters for where you can find them. So you're putting the coins in front of the person, and you're asking them to pick up both of the tokens one at a time. Can you pick up these tokens one at a time with one hand and hold on to them? So, and one, and two. Okay, for a score of one, person can pick up one coin, but not both. Okay, score of two is you're able to pick up both coins on that hand. So let's see how this girl does. Some kids with SMA and adults have sweatier hands, so if you need to quickly dry their hands off to allow them to be more successful, that is perfectly fine. She gets a beautiful score of two. She picks up the, both coins without any compensations. Common compensations. Matt? So this will slide the coin off the edge of the table, which is not allowed. Or they put the coins on top of each other and try to pick them both up on at once, which is also <laughs> not allowed. We should mention that 
um, kids are kids and our adults are adults and nobody wants to fail at everything. So some people that are coming three times a year for their Spinraza or Zolgensma evaluations, they know what's coming, they've done this test many times. We want them to avoid frustration and feel successful. So for younger kids, there's many items that you can make easier once they've um, attempted the true item and they don't need to know that um, it doesn't count to if, if you know they cheat to pick up the coin. So we want success and we want well, we want people to come back and keep coming back to see us. So all of you work with um, many diff people of different abilities and are, I'm sure, very good at adapting and getting the best performance. All right, so the next item is best demonstrated. This is looking at shoulder reaching, so taking a coin and reaching and putting in a cup at shoulder level, so shoulder, anterior shoulder flexion, okay, for a, a score of two. The, um, the individual is able to pick up a coin and place it in a cup placed at 90 degrees of shoulder flexion at end range elbow extension, okay? So if Matt has a 30 degree contracture at the elbow, a flexion contracture, I can still administer this item. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring him passively to his end range, mark that point with my cup, and then look to see if he can flex his elbow to put the coin in the cup, okay? If that's hard for Matt, I'm gonna try a score of one, and that's where Matt has gravity minimized shoulder, anterior shoulder flexion. So I'm gonna bring him to end range elbow extension with his arm resting on the table, and place the cup sideways and see if he can reach forward to place the cup, the coin in the cup. Some, let's look at a full score here for this young lady. So first, Elena is looking to see if she can, this girl can, achieve a score of a one. She does that very nicely. And so now she's going to bring her into a score of two. I'll show you the video for a score of two. Okay, here we go. The coins are fun. Lots of kids throw the coins. <laughs> it's just the thing that they do. <laughs> so be quick. Keep your eyes on the coins. I have many kids who ask me if they can take the money home. Yep, that comes up a lot too. So she had a nice score of two. Common con compensations are no-nos, so throwing the coin. Great, I love that lots of people have good accuracy. So for them, I'm like, you did it. They don't need to know that that was a compensation. Other compensations for a score of one is sliding and rest resting and repositioning your hand. Right. So we're looking for a smooth motion, okay? I have one boy that I've worked with for a few years, and he can do very few of these items, and he was part of, um, he's part of one of the studies. And I know why, and he, um, I can tell that he gets frustrated with it, and the way that he copes is by throwing the items while I'm turning to get the next thing for the test and hiding them. So I kind of go with it because I know that he knows that that's one of the few things he can do. And so um, if I was his school teacher, that would probably drive me bonkers all day. <laughs> but um, for him, that's the way he copes with knowing that these items are more challenging. OK, so the next item is shoulder abduction. So it's the same exact concept, except we're looking for shoulder abduction versus shoulder flexion. So Matt is showing us the correct start point for a score of one, which is that the person can reach to 90 degrees of shoulder abduction without excessive trunk flexion, okay? So can they reach and retrieve a coin placed at 90 degrees of shoulder abduction and range, and range elbow extension? Score of two is 135 degrees of shoulder abduction, okay? Okay, so Ellen is setting up this girl for a score of one. Compensations for this. Let's get the score of two first. We look for elbow to eye level. So obviously you're not going to be able to take a goniometer out, but if you're wondering if they're getting enough abduction, you're looking to see is the elbow at least at eye level. Okay, common compensations for this one. 
excessive trunk lean. So we define excessive as greater than 30 degrees. So if you feel that the trunk lean is contributing more to the person's success to get to the coin than shoulder motion is, then you would score down. Or sometimes they'll stabilize with their other hand on the chair because they can't, they have to use that arm to lean and to go. Okay. You guys doing okay? Okay. I won't call on any volunteers to come up. But. All right, push button. The next one is item G. This is a button, a light that you may, I guess I had them in high school so that I could stick it on the wall in my closet and light up my closet. So that's when I've used these functionally. But it's a light that has some resistance and requires a certain amount of force to turn it on. So for this item, we're, look, we're interested in hand and wrist fun strength. Okay, that's what this item is assessing. For a score of two, the person is able to fully turn the light on. So the light, they push it and it clicks. They do not have to turn the light off, so just on. For a score of one, the light lights up momentarily, but not fully, okay? You can turn the light on any way you choose. You could use your pointer finger, you could use your thumb with hyperextension, you could use all of your fingers. What you can't do, which a lot of our really smart kids do, which most of these kids are really smart, is boom, <laughs> jam your elbow, fist bump it. You can do that once you've tried the, the right way, okay? Other compensations are elbow above the level of the wrist. Okay, so we're looking for your per, pure, pure motion of the hand and the wrist. Question. One hand at a time. So, oh, full hand is fine. Yep. The only thing with full hand is that a lot of people end up pivoting and lifting their elbow up, and so then you're seeing that compensation. Yeah, that's right. No hitting, though. Okay, good. Or too much trunk lean, so you can't. This is another one that can cause frustration. So for younger kids, I assist and say, let's see if we can do it together. Okay? And again, they don't need to know that that's not a full score. All right, so next you're going to get a piece of printer paper, A4 size standard paper, and you're going to fold it into four. And you are going to say, can, I would like you to tear the paper fully with two hands. Boom. Okay. Um, for a score of two, the person can fully tear the paper all the way down using their two hands. Common compensations I see for this, young women who have long fingernails and like to start the tear a little with their really pretty acrylic nails and then finish the job. Um, another trick is teeth, so some people will try to use their teeth or some people really kind of work on it for a while and then tear it. We're really looking for no more than three attempts, okay? And if a score of two is too hard, you're gonna unfold the paper and shoot for a score of one. And just not down the middle, so one side or the other, and then. This is somewhat of a teachable task, so two and three-year-olds and even four-year-olds may not have the um, the coordination and dexterity yet to, to tear paper. And so for them, it may be less of a strength issue and more of a developmental issue. Regardless, if they're not achieving the item, you're gonna score zero. And as they mature, you'll be able to see progression and progress, okay? Item I, opening a container. This is an eight ounce Ziploc container. And you're gonna put the lid on the container fully and you're gonna say, can you take the lid off the container for me? Perfect. <coughs> Things that are okay. Stabilizing the, lid, the container against the body, stabilizing it against the table. Okay, things that are not okay. Using your teeth, which people do. Okay, levering it on the edge of the table. All right, this is another one where I have the kids try it, but if I know it's gonna be super frustrating for them, once they've tried it a little bit, I say, close your eyes, I'm gonna do some magic, open it a little, and then have them successfully finish. So just kind of making sure I get the information I need, but also allow them to feel successful. This is a very high, hard item, so it's hard even for some um, healthy individuals, I would say. So, but it's a very meaningful task, right? So we all have to open containers in life. Okay, next item, item J, brings 200 gram cup to mouth. So 
So here we are simulating what it would be like if you had strength to drink from an eight ounce bottle, essentially, of water, okay? So I'm gonna ask Matt, can you bring the cup to your mouth? Perfect, okay. So for a score of two, he can bring the cup to his mouth with one hand, okay? For a score of one, he would need to use two hands. Compensations, things that are okay. Little bit of head and neck flexion, okay? So none of us drink at the dinner table with a very stationary head and neck that doesn't move. So it's like, okay, it's supposed to, meant to be a functional task, but what we don't wanna see is excessive head and neck trunk flexion, okay? You guys doing okay? All right. Okay, so we're moving on to our tablecloth item. Should we lift it up? Sure. Show them what it looks like. Here we have tablecloth. It's, it's nice if you can get this on nylon because then you can just wipe it and clean it and, and it uh, works well that way. Some people will um, put it permanently onto a table, but obviously that's less um, usable across settings. So we will start with a 200 gram weight and that's gonna start in the center circle. And I'm gonna ask Matt to slide the weight to the outer circle for a score of one. Good job, Matt. And now I'm gonna ask him if he can do that, I'm gonna ask him to lift the weight. Perfect, okay, score of two. She lifts the weight from the center to the outside. Score of one is sliding. Compensations that would not allow you to score of one is if the slide is not a continuous motion, okay? So we're looking for a smooth trajectory. Score of another compensation is where someone might tilt the weight and then slide it, okay? So, but the grasp doesn't really matter. So as long as they can get it and lift it, that's cool. It's just when it's not a smooth trajectory. So we're gonna score this item bilaterally, and then we're gonna go on to the harder, next harder item, which is a 500 gram weight. So just upping the ante a little bit. I like these items a lot for, uh, I, I find them to be some of the more sensitive items to measure smaller, quicker changes after some sort of treatment has been initiated for people with spinraza. So I think these are really nice, sensitive items for capturing some small change. And then the next one is a diagonal reach. So this is a diagonal reach with a 200 gram weight across the body, okay? So Elena's positioning this girl at end range elbow extension, okay? So our, each, each of our el end range elbow extension is different, so it might not be that the end range requirement is that the person has to get the weight all the way to the uh, opposing circle, okay? Everyone's arm length and size are different, okay? Item N is a 500 gram sand weight, like a workout ankle cuff weight. You're gonna put the weight in the person's lap. You might have to move their power wheelchair back a little bit, and you're gonna say, can you lift the weight up and give it to my hands? So for a score of two, we're looking for 90 degrees of shoulder flexion without excessive trunk flexion, okay? That's a score of one. And let's look for a score of two. Perfect, okay? Common compensations for a score of two. Okay, so the weight dive. So we have lots of people that are able to use momentum to get the weight up, but really we're looking for more isolated shoulder motion. Common compensations for a score of one. So inching the weight off the table. Okay, so we're looking for it to be more of a smooth motion. All right, so we're moving on to the last items and then we're gonna watch a video. You've seen some nice um, examples of uh, someone who really almost probably gets a full score on this test, but we'll see a video from start to finish of someone with type two who, whose abilities will fall more on the uh, score of one for most items. The other thing to think about with this assessment is that 
while it's much more valuable for people with type 3 than the upper limb module was, you will work with individuals who will also ceiling out on this assessment. And so, but still may have upper extremity weakness in the type 3 population. So if you do this at baseline and you do it for several follow-up visits, and you're finding that really the person is, re is maintaining their arm skills, you may not do it for every one of your reassessments and you may look into something else for looking at even more difficult um, arm abilities, okay? All right, so last but not least are the items that were added to make this the revised upper limb and this is really for stronger individuals. So item O is a repeat of the entry level item. So I'm looking to see if the person can abduct their arms overhead without compensating. Okay, so this young woman, young girl, brings her arms all the way up overhead without compensating. So she gets a full score of two. Matt, will you, develop, uh, will you demonstrate a score of one? Okay, so Matt uses some compensation, but he does get his arms above 90 degrees of abduction. So all's good, Matt gets a full score of two, and then I'm gonna move on to items P through Q. So the shoulder abduction items that involve weights are for first a 500 gram weight. So I'm gonna give Matt the weight. I'm gonna say, Matt, can you give me the weight? Okay, so Matt gets a full score of two because he gets his arm above 90 degrees of abduction. He doesn't compensate by excessively leaning and he's able to lift the weight up. For these items, they weren't intended to be pure abduction with elbow extension, okay? Because most of us don't function in life like this. So if I'm gonna put away a can of soup, I'm probably not gonna put it away this way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bend my elbow. So you're, it's okay, this is more of the motion we're looking for, and not um, with full extension. And then you move on to that same item with a one kilogram weight. And then the last items are looking at anterior shoulder flexion, okay? So we'll cruise through these real quick. So we get to our type two video. Oh, actually that's a good one to look at, right? For a full score. Okay, so this is the one kilogram weight and she gets above shoulder level without compensation. Okay, so for shoulder flexion, I like, it's this, I find this motion to be less natural. Um, and so what I usually say to the kids is, can you give me a high five? So just looking for anterior shoulder flexion, okay? And then the same thing for the scoring. And then as you progress to the more difficult items, you're gonna look for a 500 gram and one kilogram, okay? So further tips for this test in all these tests is that always good to go through the whole test if you can every time. Um, once you get to know the patient, if you, if you have a really strong sense that they're, they're gonna um, not achieve the last few items, it's okay not to administer them, but the lessons I've learned over the years is that people with neuromuscular diseases surprise me especially when they're on a new treatment and something that I might have assumed they can't do and skipped trying, uh, I missed out on, on seeing something that they actually had the ability to do. So I usually try to encourage people to kind of go through the full test, okay, if you have the time to do it. So on that note, let's, do we have any questions? No questions at all. You're just too good. Yeah, it just means like, you know, the end of the day. All right, so this is a really cute little guy with type 2 SMA. And we're just gonna look through administration of some of the items for him. There he goes. So he didn't get his elbows up to shoulder level. So I'm going on to the 200 gram weight. And he does that really well. So we're looking at hands to lap here. Can you bring your hands to the table? So it's nice that that's a nice item that many people are successful with early on in the test. Here we are with tracing the path. You can also stabilize the paper for the person. So if that helps them, because we're not really caring about what they're doing with the other arm. Just looking at how they're doing with their 
mobile arm. Okay. Always looking at both sides, even for younger kids and older kids who are going to be le less dex dexterous, dex dexterous. dexterous on their non dominant hand. Okay. So believe it or not, I'm still going to give him a score of two for that because I'm not interested in his grasp pattern. I'm interested in if he can continuously move the pencil with his hand. For this item, he benefited from some cueing to, to not cheat with the other hand or use the other hand for support. This item can be more challenging for little kids because their hands are smaller. Okay? But you're going to use the same size coins regardless. Okay? And then we have the throwing coin throwing, which is a common occurrence. This is placing the coin in the cup. Okay. <laughs> Also a compensation, but a really, you know, really appropriate one. Okay, but I was able to cue him to try and do it um, the right way. There we go, our score of two. Looking to look for shoulder flexion. All right, so there's a little bit of a throw there, right? So I'm not scoring a two for that item. Okay. Always looking bilaterally. Uh, for the sake of this video, we'll, our time will move along here. Okay. So the abduction is hard for this, for this guy, for sure. Here's our push button. Now that is a compensation, so we're looking for elbow below the wrist. But I'm still going to allow him to be successful, okay? So he doesn't need to know that he's getting a score of zero. The other thing that makes this item hard for children with SMA is they have a lot of hypermobility in their fingers. Mm -hmm. So for you and I, when we push down, our fingers stay straight, theirs don't. So it makes it a lot harder for them to do this item. Try to avoid coaching. So for those of you who have used these lights before, you do have to press just right in the center to be successful. I try to let people figure it out on their own so that's this one less variable that's impacting um, my scoring. Feel free to ask questions too as, as we're kind of going through this. This is tearing the paper. So I started with a score of one for him on this um, because I, I wanted to see how he did. And if he didn't get a score of one, um, there, then there's no need for me to try a score of two. <coughs> so opening the Ziploc container. This is a hard item. So this little guy does have type 2 SMA. So just to give you an idea of his arm function as it relates to his gross motor function, um, he is able to sit when placed, but he can't transition in and out of sitting. He can roll side to side, but he needs a little bit of help to log roll. And um, he, that's about it for his gross motor skills. So he's probably about a 12 on the Hammersmith. Okay, that was a full score of two there, okay? And then, <laughs> yeah, the other thing, the weights are heavy, so, you know, just keep a close eye on, on kids as they're lifting the weights because um, they can drop them on their fingers or drop them on you or your toe, and it can be uncomfortable, okay? I talked about this one with Elena. I'm not sure why the slides are doing that. I'm sorry, guys. But um, it's just to keep you guys awake. <laughs> but uh, we're really looking for a, a natural grasp with the cup. So she advised me, I said, would you give him a score of two if he lifted the cup up the by the top of the lid? And she said, no, we're really looking for him to pick up the cup. So she would score down. Whoa, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to fix it. I'm like, wow, OK. It's, it's not me, right, moving around? OK. <laughs> All right, so here's my little buddy. Trying for the five, or he's got the 500 gram weight there. Woo! 
he gets a score one on that side, okay? For younger kids like him, I, I might take them through the motion. So I say, I want you to do a smooth motion. But that still was hard for him. Okay, and he uses his other hand. Right, so you can see on the, on the item where the lines are, where the arrows go from circle to circle. Um, so what you would want to do initially is take their arm and move it through the range of motion to where they're going to. And if they don't make the full end point, that's okay. They can just go to their full end. But you want to make sure that they're not overcompensating with their trunk or their other hand as they reach across diagonally. And you want to make sure still the rules are two. So that <laughs> obviously that obviously was not one smooth trajectory. He kind of wound up and threw his arm over. So that wouldn't be a score of two. Then you would want to test him for a score of one. You'd want to see if he could slide the weight. Now I will say with that, I'm like, okay, so he has he has pretty good strength there. So that's an example of where I would I would coach him a little bit or and say, all right, it. can you do this now without swinging your arm wide out and and throwing the weight on me <laughs> and trying to injure me? And he might he might actually be able to do it. And so then that's great. And so I got um, I got best ability. Okay, because he really is lifting his shoulder up against gravity, for sure. For this item, just make sure there's enough space between the table and um, the person's body. This is a harder one for people with little hands, so it's going to be more challenging. But you're always going to keep your equipment the same because we all grow. <laughs> So not getting a score of two or a one or a one there. And then this is our shoulder flexion. Okay? So I he's not getting a two or a one on that one either because while he was able to sh flex his shoulder against gravity, his elbow isn't above 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. Okay? So that would still be a score of zero. So I didn't administer the abduction and flexion weighted activity um, items for him um, because he didn't get a score of a two or a one without weight and that's okay to do okay so his score is zero for those okay <coughs> so how we were we're we're we have four minutes we have four minutes <laughs> questions if anyone has any questions comments Anything people, those of you who have used this, any challenges you've run into, things that you like about it, don't like about it? Great question. There's no, you know, I, I think each hospital and each clinic does things a little differently. What we adopted early on when Spinraza was approved was to uh, mimic how the study was was conducted and so we try to have the kids and adults come in sometime within a, a couple weeks before their next dose or a week after and so at least we're getting twice a year if not three for the younger kids that are changing more rapidly and so we've set that as an expectation and it's worked out well, that that is a standard expectation regardless of the person's age or abilities. Um, as we've collected information over the past couple years, I, I think at least I've found that um, three times a year for a 18 year old with type two SMA who uses a power wheelchair is probably more than necessary. The challenge is that insurance changes all the time and it's a moving target. So just last month I got an email from our coordinator, I, we, I work in Massachusetts, that United Healthcare changed their policy where they're requiring a PT evaluation within 30 days before the, the next injection. And so it's really hard to um, set standards for patients' ages and abilities versus their insurance. But and and so our our goal, at least in our clinic, is two to three times a year of a, a formal PT eval. In which case, if this assessment is appropriate for that person's abilities, then I do this assessment. So for the Stanford folks, would we be able to get into the records and get their scores? Like, are they able to get 
kids that were choosing out of If uh, the parents have my chart, it's on my chart. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some little tips are so. that uh, no, families are always are oftentimes interested in the scores and the changes over time with any of the tests and measures. And I think that um, it's really like a fine line. So if I have someone who made tremendous progress on the six minute walk test, it's really hard for me not to share that they just walked like 100 meters more. I mean, that is amazing, right? But I don't want them for the next two years to expect every time they come in to see me that they have to make this crazy change on one of these tests. And so I learned a lot of lessons. So early on when Spinraza first got approved, I was definitely much more generous about giving out scores. And I, tr I try to avoid that now. So I really focus and coach families more on, you know, these assessments are one way of capturing abilities. We know there's a lot of different things that, um, areas of change that can't be captured. And, um, but I've had families that say, we don't care, you still, we still want the score. And it's in their medical record, so I'm not gonna withhold that information. I definitely don't look at it ahead of time, though, from previous, like I don't look at my previous eval. So I pretend that I'm doing a study. Um, because I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be biased. And of course, we all want everyone to be making progress, so. So, if I understand the insurance company, but let's say mm -hmm. for a second if that was not the factor, what, how, and how would you determine what test? Sure. In the series of Chop and Ten or, sure. Chop or well, Heine or Heimersmith or would be the most appropriate for somebody who's mm -hmm. on Spinraza. Obviously, the abilities would count. Let's say you can't do the six-minute test if they're not right. walking right. independently. But what would be the best way to pick, let's say, two? Because then there's not, in a clinical right. setting, there's not enough time to perform all four tests every six months or Absolutely. all five tests. Absolutely. Right. So typically, if based on their functional ability and their age. So if you have an infant, say, less than two, you're probably going to do the chop and tend in the hiney. And then as they transition, sometimes that gets a little bit trickier. So between maybe the two and three, maybe you're still doing the chop and tend, but maybe you start at the hammersmith and the hiney. So now you're doing three assessments. And as they get a little older, if they're sitting, if it's still a type one or a non-sitter, then maybe you're doing the chop and tend still for longer and you know periods of time. But if they're a type two and they're sitting, I would say you would then transition to the Rome and the Hammersmith. But so it gets trickier when there's, let's say, an older kiddo that is technically functioning at a chop and ten level, but 100%. you still want to yeah. make but it a little bit more age appropriate. You're not yeah. going to do <laughs> right. So one so of the things we've been doing for young adults is we've been exploring the chop and ten for adults. Right. So some of the items on the chop and ten are. For someone who scores minimally on the Hammersmith, so uh, a teenager, an adult with type two who requires, is gonna get a zero to a five, say on the Hammersmith, and requires full assistance to sit and roll, I may do a baseline Hammersmith and then maybe document their Hammersmith score once a year so that if insurance says, hey, Hammersmith for type two, this is the natural history, I have somewhere documented, but I'm not gonna do the Hammersmith every time. I, I, I am gonna do an arm function test every time. So I have um, young adults with type two who use a power wheelchair. I, I may have them get out, make them get out and get on the assessment mat for a Hammersmith or a chop and 10 and modify it for, and um, as if, you know, modify it. And maybe I have them do that once or twice a year. And then any other time they're coming in, I'm gonna do, I'm, they're staying in their chair. So they do the revised upper limb. And we've also been exploring like the nine hole peg test. And I say, today I don't need to get you out of your wheelchair. Um, I'm sure it depends on so the last one. What we heard of our patient panel yesterday, <coughs> just maintaining their current Yes. Process. Yes. Do insurance companies or even you as clinicians consider like an even or a study score? Absolutely. So, yeah. so that's it. Go ahead, Matt. No, I was going to say, just if you listened yesterday to the natural history of the progression of the diseases before therapeutic agents was everyone got worse. Mm -hmm. So if you take that as your baseline, if they're on something and they're not getting worse, 
then they're getting better because they're not losing function. So even if they're maintaining that function, it's not, it hasn't gotten worse. That's, I would say you can finish mm -hmm. it, what we were gonna say. But no, that's, that's perfect. I and I, just another tip, I've, I've learned that I, I don't, and I, I work in Massachusetts, I know every state's different, so I can't apply, I can't apply this all. But I used to, in my, when, you know, Spring Magic got approved, it's so exciting, I do the baseline score, and then, uh, and, and then my, in my reavals, they have their baseline score, and then they have their score today, and then they have their score, and then I forget which um, insurance company was like, well, on that day, your revise was blah, 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 and I was like, ooh, you know what? I'm just gonna put the score they got that day. <laughs> so that if there, there's variability, or if there's a little drop in function, the, um, you know, sometimes less is more. I'm not withholding information, I'm just, looking at how they did that day. And so I don't put like data serially anymore in my eval because it, it, didn't, it didn't work to the benefit of the patient. I would make a comment on that, that usually these notes from our PT, so these uh, speech pathologists go together with our notes, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the rest of the provider. So we can make the comment, he's sick for the day, maybe mm -hmm. he's like super long and then mm -hmm. tired. So, you know, and, and we aim for the, the, for the to Yeah, but I, I had an hour conversation with someone with Neighborhood Health Plan a year and a half ago about a young girl with type three, about they didn't under, I did the revised Hammersmith and the Hammersmith and they didn't understand the difference and it almost, um, it almost limited her ability to get the <laughs> drug again. So it's really like learning kind of what the information they're looking for and um, doing the best you can, but also doing the right thing clinically and and being honest with your evals for sure Well, thanks for everybody's attention this late in the day and Always um, I did mention in the other session that Sally mentioned there's been a lot of excellent therapy related questions and so for those that we don't get to today as a group, we'll come. We'll get together and answer them, and then um, distribute that information to all of you over the next few weeks. All right. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.